we have time for one question, please? One question. Um, Charles, I, I apologize if this is simply a repeat of a question I asked you a month ago, but I think it's sufficiently different. And that has to do with a um, not a mainstream versus independent argument, but an independent versus independent argument. And I'm thinking particularly of the rather bitter and public feud between Gary Groff and Ben Sim in the night. Not even, I mean, I guess here's my question. So you're familiar with the terms of their argument. I, I know you are. So were, was neither Gary nor Dave vindicated by current economic conditions, or was one of them vindicated basically in a way that they couldn't possibly have imagined? And the reason why I, I suggest that possibility is because, one, I mean, Gary said that, you know, the, the whole virtue of the independent publisher was to protect artists from the demands of the large publishers. But then fan graphics became one of them. And then for Sim, I mean, there was this sort of maniacal attention to self-publication, but yet at the same time, it seems like you had to be Dave Sim in order to do that ridiculous thing that he was suggesting everybody else did. Who here has read at least part of Dave Sim's service? Do you know read it in Espanol? Because I saw, to my great surprise, Spanish translations in El Mundo Comico in Corte Inglés the other day, mm -hmm. which I found quite by accident. I, I say I'm surprised because uh, Dave Sim had a reputation for not encouraging, and indeed not allowing, foreign translation of his emphatically self-made and self-published comics. Uh, but there appear to be with two or three of the many volumes in the Sarah series um, exceptions to that now. Um, and it, that is, there are some uh, additions in languages other than his home language, other than English. Um, Gary Groth told me that he considered, all, and it's not the only one to tell me, uh, that he considered alternative comics to be a designation of content. And he was quite willing to concede, uh, though perhaps not without some regret, that large publishers like Pantheon had glommed onto or become interested in alternative comics. Again, as, as he remarked, as I quoted in my presentation, uh, alternative and independent publishing are no, alternative comics and independent publishing are no longer uh, coterminous. Uh, I think that Groff and others at Phantom Graphics feel ambivalent about the mixed blessing of attention that Pantheon and others have brought, not only because certain artists that used to work exclusively with Phantom Graphics now are published by Pantheon and elsewhere, but also because uh, of course, it's competition, though that you know the competition arguably is is very healthy. Uh, I'm going to infer from your question, Nick, that if Fantagraphics won that argument, it's in so many ways it could not possibly have prepared for. It, no. Right? It was the beneficiary, as so many people in comics were, of, of patterns and trends that the publishers could not have prepared for. And indeed, Fantagraphics, you might argue, was somewhat slow to recognize uh, the way things were trending. Uh, again, the publishing history of Love and Rockets and its belated turn to a different format is, I think, an example of that slowness. Right? Because after all, they were used to a particular culture. Uh, as much as Gary Groff complains about the direct market's lack of support for the kind of comics he wants to publish, that was his culture. So the pattern of adaptation was a slow one. Now, Dave Sim was, and I believe is, uh, a cartoonist exclusively adapted to the conditions of the direct market. He understood how to package a book, solicit its sale, get the book to the distributor, deliver the book on New Comics Day, El you Miarco know, Days, month after month. He understood how to do it. So even as he seemed to be losing his mind while pursuing this work for more than a quarter of a century, he remained hyper-competent at his exploitation of specific conditions. Uh, but it's been very difficult, I think this is unfortunate, to get a lot of academic or outside of comic store attention to the work that he has done, which in some ways is, 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 is quite impressive. I went to, a, I may mention this to you, I went to a talk once or a, a, a speech where Sim got up and declared the direct market to be perhaps, in terms of, of freedom of expression, perhaps the freest society since classical athletes. That seems so purblind. And limited to me. I mean, comic book stores, I love them, I've been in them for years, but they are what they are. To say that they're uh, the freest platform for personal, but for him they were because he exploited it. But now he's been orphaned. Right? In that sense? Can we take some more questions? Yes, please. We're going to Boston. We're going to Boston. Any other questions?
Thank you. I'm wondering about uh, publisher Archaia Studios. Yeah. So, um, I'm just wondering about their trajectory. Um, that's Mark Smiley, who um, Archaia is from his fantasy world. is very much a genre comic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was originally published with Serious Entertainment, at, at least in book form. And then he went off and did Archaia Studios. And, what it, and so Mouse Guard and some other quite well-known comics came out of that. But what bugs me about it is that it slowed down his serial production of Artesia to maybe one issue every other year. And so how typical is that kind of progress? Is that just kind of a weird exception where it's sort of he went independent and then you know away from a more mainstream platform and then got kind of mainstream again? Is that, is that something we're going to see? Well, you know, there are certain publishers, publishers that have either disappeared or have simply stopped producing copies. Um, uh, <laughs> slave labor graphics is one example of a fairly small independent publisher in the state of California based and serious, which I believe no longer exists, or if it does, it's in such a vestigial form that I haven't noticed lately. Um, I think Archaia is kind of a sequel to Sirius in a way. Um, I was going to include them here, but I didn't want to pejoratize them because they actually, I was going to include them in the discussion of licensing, but they actually have only a few licensed products. They license things like The Dark Crystal from Jim Henson, you know, which again is a fantasy comic. They have an increasingly diverse output for everything from original hardcover graphic novels to the rare serial. Um, I do think that um, for all but the most crappy, independent-minded festival-going self-publishing artist, uh, the, the periodical, again, has become almost a non-existent niche. You can only buy at small best festivals or another extreme. You can find floppy periodicals, either one of those. But for those who have a fairly high output, and Archaia has rather quickly developed a high output, and impressively varied, they get more and more varied all the time, they're just not doing a lot of booklet. Serialization, I mean, would you agree? Right, right. With that? Ha has Amazon also kind of shaken this up? Because you think of Amazon as a bookseller, mm -hmm. online bookseller, but you can get copies through them very easily mm -hmm. because they have all these third party sellers that will gladly sell you all copies. That's true. And of course, one can also go on eBay and other sources to find them in uh, periodicals. But it's frequently the same work is available in a collected form or even a mobile app form at this point for many of these comics. And so people may not be incentivized to go to an independent third party seller to buy the floppy chapters when they can buy five times that much in a square binding in a book that will stand on the shelf, right? Um, you know, the habits seem to be uh, uh, changing. There are quite a few other publishers that are still busily working the margins between the comic book store and the larger book market. And Archaia with books like um, Return of the Dapper Men, wasn't one of them? That one of their books, a very lavish book. It's really sort of a bookstore book. You can find it in comic stores, but they've been fairly successful at that. They just don't seem to produce. I can't get my, you know, can't get my serial entertainment fix from that kind of thing. You know. Yes. Well, I'm really glad to talk about many comics. I live in Chicago, so that's something that I've noticed, and then I've been a zine fan for here. Yeah. I was wondering um, if you talk a little about about how these multiple channels. It's also changing the way you think about the audience of comics because mm -hmm. it's no longer fanboys and fangirls anymore um, exclusively. But I, it's hard to think of how to categorize or you know, identify audiences of comics with all these things. Well, I'd say that you know, the fangirl and the fanboy themselves are moving targets, so how one defines right. people who choose to identify that way keeps changing anyway. And what was once really considered marginal um, uh, it has become increasingly accepted as a kind of level of quirk. You know, we can all get our geek on now in some particular field. Um, whereas at one time, comic book shops were really sort of the target of social appropriate and being a fan, either girl or so very often boy, <laughs> was frowned upon. Um, many comics or small press comics participate in zine culture uh, and therefore uh, they reach out to people on the basis of immediacy and accessibility, uh, either through consignment sales or often through, con through festivals and other events. They sometimes get people for um, thematic reasons. 
and maybe a particularly lovely scene or a mini comic or a scene that includes mini comics that appeals to people um, uh, that uh, just because of this topic, like Robin Chapman publishes this wonderful scene, I think it's called Four Eyes. It's all about glasses, eyeglasses, you know, about spectacles and stuff. And of course, Robin wears a particularly cool pair of spectacles. Um, and it has pros and has comics in it, and it's the kind of thing that someone who's not a self-identifying kind of girlfriend one might pick up if they were, if they saw it. And if they saw Robin or someone else smiling behind the table and they came by the museum sale and, 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 and looked at that, um, it's a truism that I am not very well qualified to confirm, but everything is niche marketing now, right? So one can use examples from popular music. There are music artists that I've been following for decades who at one time were desperately trying to sell t-shirts and other things at like concerts and do all the things that people did in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up. But you know, they basically abandoned doing that time because they don't have to, right? Uh, because the websites they maintain the downloadable so they make available. Um, some mini comics and see people make things available in whole or in part on PDF as a lure for people because not everybody's lucky enough to have a um, Dolby's bookstore, Quimby's, uh, or something like that that carries a lot of, that consigns a lot of, you know, carries a lot of uh, independent publications. Um, I see mini comics every once in a while when I go to the more enterprising shops in Greater Los Angeles or when I go to the show. And I usually just can't help myself from getting a whole bunch of them. Right? Uh, because in my neighborhood comic book store, which is an award winning one, and it's a quite good, and friendly, well run store, I just don't see that stuff at all. So it's not really a comic shop thing. I don't I'm really have any question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, it's different. It's, it's good. Okay, I think we, we could go on and on, but uh, I'm afraid we have to. So, thank you.